Hey everybody, welcome to this video. And I've been building a dashboard for a talk I'm giving at the Data Dev Day conference, which is going to be the first of its kind. It's happening on Thursday, May 20th, uh, mark it in the calendars. And the here we go, actually, you can take a quick look. This is really gonna be focused more on the developer side of the Tableau ecosystem. So we're talking there about the REST API, the metadata API, the Hyper API, um, all the APIs. And so that's that's very much more about like how do you automate things in your Tableau ecosystem and less so about how do you build the dashboards. But ironically, in that all that process, I wanted to build a dashboard just to have something to point to and that's, that's kind of playing with some cool, interesting data and in this case, it's uh, cryptocurrency pricing data. And I figured this was a really good opportunity to take a deeper look at this dashboard rather than just use it as a 15 second prop in, the, in that talk. Um, I noticed that while I was building this, I was really reaching into this basket of experience I have from working with clients in the, in the real world to, to build these production grade dashboards. And even though I was building this dashboard just for myself for this talk, um, I when I stopped and I thought about it, I was like, oh, uh, everything I've learned over the past six years of building these things is is a, in some way incorporated into this dashboard. And so let's uh, let's do this. Let's have a video series uh, starting with this one where we're going to go from start to finish where I'm going to build this dashboard that we see in front of us and you can follow along. Um, I encourage you to actually. It's uh, it's how you get the the best learning in there is um, really seeing something's possible and then building uh, your own version of it. But um, but for this video, we're just going to take a step back and we're going to we're going to talk about the the first stages of building a dashboard, and specifically scorecard dashboards. So here I've called this the crypto price scorecard, and we see a particular kind of layout here. Uh, there's certain types of information being conveyed. So let's walk through this, um, kind of walk through each component that's really existing here, or at least each variety of components that we see in this dashboard, and then talk about you know who is the audience for this one. I mean, spoiler alert, it was me, I'm the audience, so it's fairly easy for me to communicate to myself what it is I want to see. But, uh, but for, for you watching and for anyone who's, who's wanting to know, you know how can I build better scorecards or better dashboards, uh, you're really going to start with that question of who's your audience and that's going to help, you, help inform you, you know, how interactive do I want to build this dashboard, how in depth is it going, uh, how much information just needs to be readily available without interacting with anything. When you look at the dashboard, all, all this kind of stuff is there. There's not really a right or a wrong answer to it. It's, it's so subjective to who you're building the thing for. Uh, so let's get to know this dashboard a bit. First of all, we can see that there is a filter up here where we could choose which cryptocurrency pair we're looking at. Uh, maybe somebody came here just for the crypto. And if you did, uh, that's totally fine. We can just cycle through some of these and we can see that we get different, uh, completely different data on the dashboard depending on which uh, filter selection we make here. And let's just park this on maybe like Ethereum, uh, either Ethereum or Bitcoin, you know, one of the, one of the big ones um, and see what else is going on in this dashboard. So on the top left, which is typically where you would want to put your most, uh, you know, important information or maybe not important, uh, maybe that's not the right word, but like urgent. Where, where do you want people to look first? You typically want to put that up here in the top left. Um, and in this case, what I care about first when I land here is how am I doing at a daily level, a weekly level, a monthly level, quarterly, and yearly level? Basically, all the time periods that I care about, I want to see a really quick snapshot of how am I doing now, you know, in the current period, how am I doing today versus yesterday? Or how am I doing this week versus last week? And so on. Uh, so up here at the top, we're seeing this, this entire bar shows me where the, uh, the closing price for Ethereum versus uh, the US dollar. So this is the price of Ethereum 
in US dollars. Uh, this bar is showing me where we ended today. And then this little black reference line is showing me where it where we ended, what the closing price was yesterday. Now that pattern is gonna repeat itself for weekly, monthly, quarterly, and all the way down here to yearly, where this blue bar is showing us what the value was um, or what the average closing price is for this year, the average daily closing price. By the way, I should have mentioned that before. You know, At the daily level, it makes sense. This is the daily closing price. But at the weekly level, uh, rather than summing up all of our closing prices and having some number that's about seven times higher than daily, instead we want all these time periods on equal footing. So we're talking, when we look at weekly, this is showing us the average weekly closing price. Uh, this is the average monthly closing price, average quarterly, and so on. So anyways, down here, um, the pattern repeats all the way until we get down to the year. And so this blue bar is showing us what the average daily closing price is for the year. And then this black line is way back here. We can see that our year is, is way outperforming our previous year. Uh, we're up 341% year over year. And then uh, even quarter over quarter, we're up 207%. Um, so just a little bit of information for you here because this isn't, uh, I didn't randomly stitch this scorecard together. I, I've built these kinds of scorecards for many clients and uh, a lot of times this is important information because we can tell like at a monthly, weekly, and daily level, we're, we're hovering right, about, right around where we were in the previous period. But, uh, but just at a glance, only looking at this section, we can see that um, while it's been pretty consistent for the last you know month or so, uh, the last quarter even, this, this quarter that we're in compared to the previous one, this thing has exploded in price. And we can tell that because here's where that previous price is. So anyways, I don't wanna harp on that too much. You all know crypto, you know it's been on a crazy bull run uh, at the time I'm recording this. Who knows, maybe if you're watching this in the future, everything's tanked and it's, uh, it's completely slumped again. But, uh, but hey, that's just more reason to pull this data again and have something interesting to look at. Uh, but just some some things to think about, like uh, like when you're talking about designing a scorecard dashboard, um, I didn't just slap this together. There's some stuff going on in the background that, that we'll talk about in the in the future videos when we're really building this thing out. But, uh, but they're really little things that add up. And one of those things is, is something like, like the color choice. Like you'll notice in this dashboard, we, we don't see a whole lot of color. Uh, it's almost a personal preference of mine that when, I, when you do have color, it should really, really mean something. And in this case, uh, color only really appears in two places. You have this very slight gray versus black down at the bottom to see our moving average compared to our, um, our actual closing prices. And then up here you have blue if you're outperforming your previous time period and you have orange if you're underperforming. So that's one thing, but, but another thing is even more subtle and it's that uh, all of these charts are aligned and uh, they are, if I exit out of this, you can see that these are actually different like I, I call them components, but they're, they're different worksheets. They're different uh, visuals in and of themselves. Like I go into this visual and it's its own sheet. It's doing its own thing. Uh, whereas, you know, everything here is, it's, it's, uh, it's really independent. And this is just a, in some ways, a personal preference of mine, but it's something I really encourage you to consider as you're building your scorecards and building these dashboards, these really production grade dashboards. Because if you, uh, if you don't build things to be kind of independent components, what you're going to run into is people are going to uh, cherry pick pieces of your dashboards and they're, you know, your stakeholders, basically. They don't care that, uh, that a worksheet is, you know, if you've built a visual, let's say this entire thing was a worksheet, your stakeholders don't care that if you change one thing, it's going to impact everything else. Like that, that's a fact that is erroneous to them. They, they, if they want the weekly to behave a certain way, and then they, they don't want that behavior to apply to monthly or daily, uh, that's on you to figure out. And so you're doing yourself a favor in a lot of situations. If you take these uh, these considerations ahead of time, and rather than pinning yourself into a corner with how you develop something, 
you develop it to be flexible. You anticipate that there will be changes that you need to make and you, you do as much as you can up front to make sure that when it comes time to change the dashboard, uh, you don't have to rework everything just because when you were building the thing, um, you didn't make it flexible enough. Anyways, uh, I could rant about that all day, um, but let's keep rolling through this. So, so we've talked, uh, talked about this a good bit. Uh, over here on the right-hand side, I'm not going to say too much about this. This is really just an extension of what you see on the left, and I normally really wouldn't put this into a dashboard, but uh, for the data dev talk that I'm building, the, the whole concept of this dashboard is that something that's going to be printed out to PDF. Uh, like we're gonna cycle through all of these filters and then print them to, to PDF basically. It's like one of those types of projects where uh, the concern isn't so much interacting with a data visualization on Tableau server, the, uh, the audience would, would rather have some PDFs printed out and delivered to um, the desired audience. And so in, in this case, uh, everything over here is just basically a printed out tooltip so that when we print this to PDF, uh, you get all the information that you get from, from this section over here on the left, but in a kind of nice paragraph format. So anyways, that leaves us down here with this, uh, the, the trend line. And so uh, in general, the layout of the dashboards and of scorecards, you're, regardless of your audience, you're probably going to want to follow that Z pattern where you go from the top left being the most important and urgent information to see. And then you go over here to the right, uh, you come down to the bottom left and then finally end at the bottom right. And those quadrants that you can think about, uh, those four different sections of the dashboard are really kind of the top left is your is your hot, most high level information and the bottom right is your most granular, generally speaking. Um, and that's doubly so in Tableau where you have this idea of being able to click on a visual and that triggers a filter. Uh, like maybe up here, if I were to click on this bar, you could have a dashboard where me clicking on this filters this trend line somehow. And so uh, it's, it's doubly true that you wanna follow that Z pattern typically in Tableau because you could have cascading filters almost where you, you click on your top left visual, it filters something in the, in the right, you know, the top right, and then you click on something there and it impacts uh, all the, the sheets beneath. And so you could just have that, that kind of logical flow. Um, in this case, the, the reason I have my trend line down here at the bottom as opposed to up at the top is not only that I, I want to see this information first, but it's also just a practical thing about layout space. This chart down here is kind of greedy. It uh, takes up a lot of space and I want it to take up a lot of space. Like uh, I don't want to, uh, I guess I already used the word greedy, but I don't want to get too greedy with the, the amount of space in my dashboard and start trying to, to really push this, condense this into too tight of a space because um, if you do that, your dashboard starts to look terrible. Let's just be real. So I guess that's, um, that really lands us on that uh, final point I want to make about layout and everything um, is when you're when you're considering how you're building your dashboard, really keep in mind that you'd rather err on the side of um, having more dashboards to answer different types of questions than than putting everything into one dashboard and trying to make this this one single dashboard that rules them all and answers all the questions. Um, that's not only a nightmare to maintain, it's also just usually ends up being worse for your end users. Uh, so if someone's really pushing the point, you know, you can just, uh, at some point, I think, I think you have, you're responsible for pushing back as the person developing this thing and saying like, uh, I hear what you're asking for. We can deliver that information to you, but it's going to be in two different dashboards. I, I highly recommend, don't be afraid to push back. A lot of times people, uh, people ask for something and if they don't know what they're talking about, maybe they just need you to kind of hold their hand a bit and explain, I know what you're asking for and we can, we can get you the end result you're looking for, but we might have to do it in a slightly different way than what you had in mind. And I, I mean, I don't think that's any problem at all, right? Like if you, if you don't know anything about cars and you take your car into the shop and they tell you like, um, Hey, this, this belt needs to be replaced and you don't know anything about cars, what are you gonna do, tell them like, no, I'd really rather keep the same belt, but have the car run better. Like, it doesn't make any sense. 
So uh, don't be afraid. You're the expert in the room. Um, deliver your expertise. So uh, there's a couple other little UI things going on here that are that are really minor in the the way it's presented, but are are really significant when these these little things add up. Is uh, here I have parameters. I have parameters controlling. Here, let me get back into the presentation mode so that we don't see all of the boxes being highlighted. But uh, but we can control the number of days in the trend line. So maybe we want to, uh, you know, things are a little bit compact if you're looking at 200 days worth of data. And we really want to zoom in on a uh, you know, tighter uh, timeline. We can do that. And we can interact with that directly here. And I like this kind of setup where we know we're looking at the price trend for uh, Ethereum. And here I've even built this component of the dashboard such that as I hover over the title, it's telling me, uh, hey, you can edit these things. Uh, but uh, but to me, this just really helps with, um, instead of having a parameter way up here on the north star of the dashboard where it says days and trend line, somebody, somebody's looking at the trend line down here, but now they have to go all the way up here to edit the number of days. Uh, you know, why do that? You know, this is the 21st century. Um, we can, we can, there's a better way. So we can put these parameters down here and um, then I am also able to edit here the number of days that are in the moving average. And something I really wanted to showcase here was just, there are these very small things that you can do that make a big difference in the user experience, right? So smart use of your parameters, um, smart use of conveying information, bouncing that back off of your users. I really highly uh, recommend thinking of these, these little things that you can do to, to help make the, the entire experience of using the dashboard a little bit better for your end users, especially if you're building for an audience that's not um, day to day in the data trenches. Like if you're building for an analytics uh, audience, you're probably not gonna put as much time into this user uh, experience aspect, or at least I wouldn't, just being honest, as, as if I'm building for like an executive suite or I'm building for even, you know, higher level um, directors. So uh, yeah, that's the, that's the introduction to this dashboard and all these various components that we're seeing here, we're going to bring that to life in the future videos. And just to give you a preview of what we're going to be doing in the next video, if we hop into one of these worksheets, you're going to notice this, um, this data pane over here. And I've got, I have a particular way of organizing my, uh, my formulas. You know, like if I go into one of these folders, we're going to see that everything is kind of consistent in its naming and it's serving a specific purpose. And so one of the things we're going to talk about in the next video as we build this out is, is sort of some of, the, uh, some of the nightmares that I encountered maybe that, uh, that led me to adopt these kinds of practices and you know why when you're building a production level uh, dashboard that you might not be the person maintaining it in a few months, especially if you're a consultant building something for a client. It's, uh, it's really important to, to kind of build things to be organized and to be easily searchable um, and just a, a much smoother experience to interact with. So anyways, we'll, we'll focus on that, the, the data sources, getting all of the data sources right is gonna really set us up for, uh, it's gonna make or break the maintainability of your dashboard, just to put it plainly. Uh, all right, so hopefully I see you in that next video where we really get into building the data source. And then after that, we'll have videos on building these individual components and uh, kind of efficient ways that you can build one and then duplicate it and, and uh, really minimize the changes that you need to put in place to, to make something like this entire dashboard come to life. So see you there. And also don't forget Data Dev Day, Thursday, May 20th. Hope to see you there as well, and uh, maybe even in that in the talk I'm giving um, about automating things using the APIs in your uh, Tableau ecosystem. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.